Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome the best, one of the best couple in the world, <laughs> Kuya Eric and Adi Casey. Ooh. Praise God. How many of you are in this place and you are single? Raise your hand. Wow. Amazing. Well, I, listen, it's really great that you're here. You know, sometimes we just say, parenting seminars or just for married couples, you know, parents, but where else are you going to learn? <laughs> and uh, hopefully there'll be some things that you could pick up now that you could carry over later. So if you're not single, how many of you wish you were single? No, I'm, jo I'm joking. <laughs> Not allowed. Nope, you can't give them back. <laughs> They're yours. You can, I'll take yours. There's, yours is easy. There's no reversing. <laughs> no, no that, that's, uh, that's part of the joys of parenting. So we're going to get into a lot of things today. And as you can see, I have a mic. Casey has a mic. Hello. We're going to go back and forth a lot, unless she just talks way too much. But um, That's everyone's fear, right, I'm sure. Whether you're single or you are a parent with one or more children, we want you to use this time to ask questions. Okay? I rebuke shyness in Jesus' name. Amen. You are not allowed to be shy. Okay? If, John, you're going to ask me, well, how do I find a wife? That's not the seminar today, John. <laughs> As you can see, you know, even from the Sylvie family today, you see their kids up there, right? You see them respectful. You see them honoring their parents. They're not like on their phones and wishing they were somewhere else and yeah. complaining, I'm hungry and all those things. Look, kids are gonna be kids. And, and parents, let me encourage you, they will grow up one day. And they will be responsible. There is a day coming when you will not have to change another diaper. <laughs> Until your grandparents. <laughs> Says a mama who's in the middle of it. You've all heard somebody say, it goes by so quickly. Our eldest daughter's turning 26. Next week. Next week. It's insane. I'm only 27. <laughs> Yeah. We're not Mormons, babe. We're, you know, you're not my fourth wife, okay? Uh, one thing, real quick, we have, you've heard us talk about this book. Um, you've heard me talk about the book God the Rod and Your Child's Bod, right? Uh, that was written by a guy named Larry Tomzak, who's been a spiritual mentor to us for many, many years. But he renamed it the book and it's called the little handbook on loving correction how to raise happy uh what is that obedient respectful children this book right here as small as it is and as compact as it is probably had more of an impact upon our marriage our i would say in ways our theology and upon raising children than any other book outside the Bible. We have found this book to be very helpful in training our children. So we have seven copies and we're going to sell them for only 250 each, okay? 250,000 pesos each. And uh, no, 250 each. So if you want to get one, just let us know at the end. Um, I wish we could just give everybody a copy, but um, we try to get these and make them available to people, which we'll probably order more when we're in the States. It's hard to get them here. So I just think it would be a great resource. And then towards the end of some of the seminar today, we are also going to 
have other books that we would recommend. So if you can order books online or do like Kindle or something like that, it, just other resources, okay? We're not saying it's required to raise godly children. But, you know, if you want to be a good parent, you do whatever you can to learn, right? Yeah, I wanted to say this too. You know, if you want to become a doctor, you invest years yeah. to learn how to do that. If you a teacher, whatever it is, we invest many years and a lot of money to become that. And one of the things that's the hardest job on the planet that we spend the least amount of preparation time for, well, one is marriage, and the other one is parenting. Yeah. And both are worth our time, our investment, and our energy. So it's, it's a valuable um, amount of time spent. And as if you're already parents, you know that your, your life is already busy. But even if you were teaching, like when we were teachers, we had every so many months, you have professional development, right? You have to continue to develop in your skill. And that's the same thing as parents. Your life is busy, but it's worth it to continue to professionally develop those skills to become better. So we put together an outline today we're going to start going over in a moment. Um, you may not see everything on there that you were hoping we would talk about, but we're hoping that if there's something on your heart, a question, um, that it will help stir up you know, conversation, communication. Our goal for coming to the Philippines had a lot of vision behind it, but one of the main reasons we're here is to see godly marriages and godly families raised up. Yeah. Amen? Let me get into this, and you'll see the notes behind me. Last year, uh, April 15th, 2023, I wrote this on Facebook. I wrote, parenting never ends. It is easy to understand that parenting begins after you have a child. So when does parenting end? Parenting never ends, not even when we die. Who we teach our children to worship and what we teach them to become is forever. Amen. Listen, your children, as much as you call them your children, belong to God the Father. Yeah. And He gives them as a loan to you and I to raise His children. So whatever we do, we have to understand the incredible responsibility that we have to pour into God's kids. Amen? If Jesus lives in us and we live for him, then just as the Father parents us, we ought to know how we are to parent the children God gives to us. So first, parenting begins before we are born. Before you were alive, God the Father has always been alive. Parenting comes from the heart of God. It is not something that just happened after Adam and Eve had their first child. No, parenting, God reveals himself as Father. Parenting begins when God gives us life, obviously. Right? When you had your first child, those of you who are parents, your child immediately made you a physical parent. Now, if you're single and you do, you're not married yet, you don't have children yet, you can actually have spiritual sons and daughters because the Great Commission tells us that we are to make disciples. So the Great Commission looks like the beginning of when God spoke to Adam and Eve. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. In other words, I'm giving you authority to be responsible, be the stewards of this world. He gave that to parents. He didn't just make Adam and Eve as these supernatural beings just to work signs and wonders. No. 
God's heart has always been family. Amen. That's why if you don't have a good relationship with your father or mother, or you don't know them, or you've been adopted, whatever the situation, it's painful. It's not only painful because you feel it in your emotions, it's painful because God's heart says, that's not how I want family to look like. So understand this, if you feel pain of things not being right with your parents, then guess what? God feels that even more than you do. And He is so willing for you to look to Him as a parent to restore you, to reconcile you, so that you can do what He's asked Adam and Eve to do even from the beginning and later on Jesus with the Great Commission that we can make disciples. So if you're single, you can make disciples, sons and daughters, right? They may not physically come from your being, but if you lead them to Christ or you pour your life into them, some of this will translate for you today. Parenting begins as we mature in our sonship. The more you understand who you are in Christ as a son or a daughter, the earlier on that you understand that, the better equipped you will be to be a godly spouse or parent in the future. That's why single people do not waste time in walking in purity and integrity. The more time that you waste, the harder you make it on yourself to be prepared for what's next. Parenting begins when we honor the parents that God gave to us. Even if you didn't have great parents, we're called to honor them. There's a difference between obeying and honoring. And we have to understand that, okay, some people they might be interchangeable. But you don't obey somebody if they say, go to the top of the building and jump off. Right? That's not what God the Father would say. But what do you do? Well, I'm listening to what you're saying, but I don't agree with it because based on God's word, that's not what he wants me to do. But I still honor who you are in my life, but I disagree with you. Hopefully your parents won't ask you to go do something like that, but uh, you understand. There's going to be moments in your life, whether you're young or whether you're old, where your parents might not walk with the Lord like you do. And so there may be disagreements and people out of alignment with God's word. But that doesn't make it right for you and I to make up an excuse to not align ourselves with God and His Word because we had a bad experience. We have to honor our parents. Why? Because God says if you do, it'll go well with you. God is concerned about you. And whether you don't think that He was because He allowed hard things to happen, the fact of the matter is, you got to see things from his perspective, not your victim mentality. Parenting begins as Jesus reconciles us to our heavenly father. Wow. How many of you, as soon as you got born again, you started to realize God was your father that brought tremendous healing in your life. Amen? Yeah, a lot of us felt that. Maybe you felt the ability to forgive your natural father for the first time. And you thought, wow, where does this come from? That's what it means to be born again, my friend. And look, as you honor your father because you honor your father in heaven, guess what? You're preparing to be a godly father. You're preparing to be a godly mother yourself. Our parenting begins when we stop living so self-centered. The gospel, we know, is all about deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. Right? Parenting 
is God's wonderful way to teach you how to die. <laughs> to yourself, to your time, to your sleep. To me time. To me time. Ooh. To spending your money. Yay, yay. Oh. <laughs> Some of the parents here with little kids are like, yeah. yeah. Listen, don't, sh don't you all think that we should become less self-centered? <laughs> because the gospel is, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So if you really love yourself, you'll stop making life all about you. And then you won't have a bad attitude when God says, be fruitful and multiply. Right? Because we think that we're so unique that we're, yeah, we think we're just going to have one or two kids. You know, that's really all we want. Well, why is that all you really want? Huh? Why is that? Because convenience. Right? Now, I'm not saying that God's telling you how many kids that you need to have. And if you only have one child, maybe having one child was a miracle for you. I know people who could not have children, and they have the one, they're like, it was so dangerous. Okay, there's a lot to consider. But the issue is, don't say, I'm not going to be fruitful and multiply, because I want to have me time. People say, have said to us over the years as missionaries, are you guys sure you need to keep having so many kids? Isn't it more expensive as missionaries? And I'm like, where in the Bible? Everything that you're telling me is opposite of what God says. Be fruitful and multiply. Have faith. I own everything. Discipleship is always expensive. Hello? So, so what are we really saying if I can't be fruitful and multiply? Me time. Some people are, this is being recorded. Welcome those who are watching on YouTube or listen to podcasts. Don't get mad. Jesus loves you and has a wonderful plan to multiply your life. Amen. <laughs> get mad at Pastor Buddy, okay? He's, it's hard to get mad at Pastor Buddy. He's always happy and smiling. It's easy to get mad at me, you know, but Pastor Buddy, get mad at him. Um, <laughs> listen, parenting begins when we fall in love with our God-given spouse. I'm going to tell you something. The Lord challenged me when I moved to the Philippines. He said, Eric, you have a great love for my church and my bride. But if you don't learn how to love the woman that I put right in front of you, you will never have the affections I need you to have for my church, my bride. It was like a Mike Tyson right here. Seriously. And there wasn't... It wasn't because I was making excuses. It was, I was trying to be a husband, a father, according to my way. But God has a way for you to conform to the image of Christ. And the image of Christ is husbands, you lay your life down for your family. Specifically your wife. And in doing so, you raise up godly children who understand that my dad loved my mom. The greatest thing you fathers can show your kids is how much you love their mom. It's absolutely true. And it's easy to argue and point out the blemishes and, and make up excuses and issues. But let me tell you something. Stop being self-centered. It's not about you, but I'm the man. I have authority. Well, remember, there's an authority above you. 
And if you're a real authority in the kingdom, the greatest among you becomes servant. So don't make an excuse for trying to tell your wife to submit. That's what the Bible says. Read the rest of that chapter. (laughs) Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Ouch. Parenting begins when we have children. Listen, we've told you so many stories. I don't really want to take too long on this because we both have a lot to share today. But when we found out that Sierra, then Abby, then Jonathan, and David, and Hannah, I mean, that, we, we didn't really make up plans. How many kids do we want to have? I don't know. How many do you want to have? I don't know. We never talked about it. It never came up in our conversation. Even we, when we're, we should have. We never did. We probably should have. We probably should have planned better like everybody said we should. But here's the fact of the matter. All our kids love Jesus. And never once did we say, oh no, we don't want this kid. Never once did it ever, even when we were living in sin, did we think, let's have an abortion. You know why people have abortions? It's because of convenience. And then when they get older, and they have nobody who cares about them, They blame God because they didn't do things his way. But they don't want to admit it. Because the hardest thing for us is to admit that we were wrong. As we had children, I want to tell you, our kids has has brought us more joy than the ministry ever could. And I love the ministry. We give ourselves over to it 100%. But I want to tell you, there's nothing like your own kid raising up and says, Mom, Dad, God's calling me to Japan. Mom, Dad, God's calling me to go work with this program in Alabama and it's it's kind of tough, but I really feel called. Mom, Dad, I want to go work in the fields with Ken Pounders for the summer. I want to study to be an engineer because that's, Mom, Dad, I want to worship Jesus. I want, to, I want to seek the Lord on my own. And you walk by your kid's room during the day and you hear them crying out to God. Friend, that is worth everything. Yeah. Parenting begins when we have spiritual sons and daughters. I mean, it took on a whole new realm in our lives to have many of you are spiritual sons and daughters that are not just for us, from us, but we share with the Valdez, with the Garcias, with different ones that parent you in a spiritual sense. You know, seeing people that you pour into go out and do the works of the kingdom, that's beautiful. I'm telling you why parenting never ends. Parenting begins... When our children repeat the same process. I could spend a lot of time on that. Parenting begins when our children become adults. Parenting begins when our children are married. We're not there yet. The Valdez are there. (laughs) Parenting begins when our children have children. Woo, Karim! Wow. We're not there yet. You're almost there. You're almost there. (laughs) Well, you've been there a long, long time. You know, I found a picture the other day of me, you, your, your daughter, and their two kids standing together in Maryland. And I said, Jesus, have your way. Yes. Parenting begins when our children see us go to heaven. Listen, my kids have heard me and Casey says the same thing publicly for many years that when we die and we go to heaven whenever that is whether it's tomorrow or a hundred years from now which would be very old like Melchizedek stuff because I'm 50 now when we go to heaven they're going to know this there is no doubt where my dad is where my mom is you know why? 
Because we don't just live it here in front of the church before you. We live it at home with our kids. And when we die, they're going to sense a responsibility that I believe like a mantle falling from Elijah came upon Elisha. Now whether they become a flaming revivalist, evangelist, or homeschool apostle, you know what? Whatever that might be, it doesn't matter to us. We're not trying to make our kids into anything. We want them to find out who God's made them to be by living holy, devoted lives to the Lord even when we're not in front of the church. Parenting begins when our grandchildren discover their legacy. I I have a dream that whether it's grandkids or great grandkids who may not really know us or me that they would hear somebody one day talking about I knew your grandfather I read your your grandfather's little devotional book not many people read it but I read it and it changed my life you understand what I'm saying is that we want to live with such high standards, kingdom standards, that when we get to heaven, we'll be able to look down with Paul the Apostle, (laughs) Peter. Look at that. The seed is there. The kingdom seed is there. And it's continuing to mature. Amen? Amen. Parenting never ends. Let me read these two scriptures and then we'll start in the notes. Proverbs 20 verse 7. The righteous man walks in integrity. His children are blessed after him. I'd say that for the ladies as well. Psalm 90 verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place for all generations. Listen, parents, if you want to learn how to be a good spouse or a good parent, the best thing you can do is learn how to give your life to Jesus. Put him first, whatever it looks like. Listen, my kids hear me singing, hear me worshiping, hear me crying almost daily. And I don't say that as accolades for myself. I simply say that because that is the secret sauce. You know, whenever Americans come here and they want to go to Penang's, they go, what is in that barbecue sauce? Right? Kevin Cracknell learned how to make the barbecue sauce. And so it's like his secret sauce now, but he stole it from Penang. So not a very good missionary. I love you, Kevin. (laughs) People want to know, what's the secret, right? What's the secret to parenting, to a godly marriage? Friend, I want to tell you, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. They know the Lord. There's no shortcuts. Let's get into it. So, we got three points. Number one, develop family bonds. Number two, communication and roles of parents. First of all, develop family bonds. I'm going to give this over to Sister Cassie Miller. <laughs> so first, we uh, wanted to cover what's, what we call filling your child's love tank. And this is actually something we got from Larry Tomzak in this book. And what that means is before you can correct or before you can bring discipline, you first have to make sure that that child knows that they're loved. Everything balances on how God treats us. So when the Lord first, remember when you first came to Jesus, okay? Just memory lane, okay? When you first came to Jesus, did you come because he said, you're a sinner, you're going to hell? I hope that's not what happened. I hope that when you came to Jesus, it was because of the cross, because of the gospel, the basic gospel, according to Romans 1.16, is not, you're evil sinners, you're going, it is, 
the power of God that brings salvation for all who believe, right? So we come to him because he's loving, he loves us, he saves us, he sets us free, he's good, right? So if I try to discipline someone else's child, they're not going to receive it like my children. And the reason why is because I have a foundation with my children that I love them and they know that I love them, that we love them. And how do we do that? We have to, quote, fill their love tank. Well, how do you do that? That takes some study. Now, th there's a famous author, I won't mention him on YouTube, but there's a famous author that has a book about the five love languages, right? And that's really important and it's good to read. But the reality is, if you will study your child, you don't actually need a book because that's a shortcut. It's easy, but the hard thing is studying. Watching, the same with your spouse. If you watch and you learn what makes them happy, you learn what makes them smile, that's what you do. It's really that easy, but it takes effort, time, and energy. So you watch, when you do this with your child, how do they respond? When you give something to your child, how do they respond? When you say good words to your child, how do they respond? And when you see that and you study that, you'll learn what makes them feel loved. So you try all of them, okay? You try the hugs. You try the words. You try the gifts. You try the serving. All of the different things that those love languages, which by the way, I think there are actually more than five and a multiple, you know, the book even mentions that it could be multiple combinations of those things. But you watch and you decide, I'm going to do something every day to show my kids that they are loved. That is the foundation first. And that means that after that, you can start to think about discipline. You could start to think about correcting behaviors. So the first one in filling your child's love tank is, which I kind of referred to it already, is modeling your relationship with God. When I spend time with God, I go to a room, I shut the door. <laughs> That's not possible for everybody, especially younger stages of parenting. And early on, we had to learn how to balance those times. I had time, she had time, but the reality was that Casey's time was usually always holding somebody, feeding somebody, or they need mama more than they wanted dad. Now they want dad They all walk the time, right so. past dad and go dad to the now. bathroom and knock on the door while I'm in the shower and he's sitting right there. Mom! <laughs> and he's going, what do you need? I need mom. What do you need? Mom, what do you need? Oh, I just need to know if I can have a cracker. You can't and ask dad if you can have a cracker? No, you have to ask. And secretly I'm what? sitting there going, praise God. Let me get back to the basketball game. No, 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 no. No, that's what Josh told me he does. But, um... <laughs> No, but it's, they need mama a little bit earlier on. And yet, guys, we got to do our part to help alleviate. You know, I've, I, we, when we were on the retreat and we watched Nathan and Kathy with their family, you know, and they've got a lot of little people. And Nate, or Kathy was working through the night trying to sleep in a tent, <laughs> you know, and, and this guy <laughs> was yelling, screaming, Nathan was taking him, going away so he mom could singing. rest. He that was singing. That wasn't singing. singing. He kept all of us up. Every single one of us were up because of you. <laughs> and so, you know, as we, and you know, part of the calling upon my life, I, I really have to be hearing from God on a regular basis. And I felt like I also had a word from the Lord early on. If you want to prophesy publicly, you got to pray privately. And so how do I do that? Well, you got to balance it out. And, and there was a family, 
uh, Sam and Eliza Fine. They were uh, associate pastors to Larry Tomzak. They look like the absolute perfect family. Like everything they did was right. Their kids loved God. They were obedient. Yes, mommy. Yes, daddy. You know, I mean, it just seemed like everything. And we're watching them going, how do you do that? Like, Sierra's will is so strong, we don't know if we're going to have to give her away, you know? <laughs> and, but, oh, you need to pray together as a family. Okay, let's pray together as a family. Sierra's like, I'm done, you know? <laughs> and, and we had to learn how to train her, right? To sit still and hear the voice of God and learn how to sit in meetings, right? Can I encourage you parents with something? If you want your kids to hear from God, they need to know that you're modeling for them to hear from God. So that means when you're in a meeting like this and your kid's on the phone, you're teaching them that that's okay to do. Listen, I understand the convenience, but you want to know how to raise godly children, right? Well, doing that, is going to cost you something. Denying of self. Right? Because when you give them that phone, you're making it easier for you. So you can pay attention. But what happens when your kid is 15 years old and says, I hate church? Pastor Armin, fix them. Right? Nathan, we don't know what to do. Now, do it now. Amen. You can't waste time. You've got, listen, modeling a relationship with God is not just closet time. It's learning how to walk with God in life. Yeah. Do you have something you want to say? No, I was going to say for the younger parents, a lot of times in this generation, you don't know how to parent without technology because everybody around you is doing that. If you don't know how to do it, they didn't have it. We didn't have it. They didn't have it. Ask someone, what did you do in your generation? We didn't, we didn't raise our kids with technology, and that's why our younger ones, if they ask to be like their friends, um, look, we've been parenting longer than most of the parents that have 13-year-olds because we have a big gap. We have a 26-year-old and a 13-year-old. So... Because of that, our 26-year-old, we raised her whole life pretty much without technology. So the other 13-year-olds, their parents are young and, you know, they never raised kids without... I'm like, you don't need it. I'll tell you what your sister did. I'll tell you what your brother did. And that's yeah. how you do it. Yeah. And, and here's the thing. If you're, since we're on the subject, we're not saying you can't use technology, mm -hmm. but set borders mm -hmm. yeah. start stop certain places yes other places no our kids have a total understanding of when they can and cannot be on technology computers iphones ipads yeah. whatever i don't care if it's a little game that just makes noise okay I'm saying anything that can distract them. How are your kids going to be still and know that he's God if they're always busy? Look, I understand it's a part of our life. I am on my computer every day, hours at a time. I'm writing books. I'm working on classes. I'm preparing for messages. I'm watching dumb YouTube videos. I'm on Facebook making sure Nathan's not being rude to people. You know, there's... <laughs> We're skipping all over. No, I, I get it. It's a part of what we do. But listen, you got to have borders. And if you tell your child, look, mommy and daddy don't want you watching this in church or we don't want you doing this right before bed because that's by you've been having bad dreams or you know what I'm saying. At first, your child is going to turn into, you know, Leviathan. Okay. <laughs> They're going to go, you don't care about me. You know, why don't you allow me to do this? And all you say with patience is, shut your mouth. 
Who bought that phone is what I say. Yeah. Who bought that phone? And then you say, <laughs> listen, that's not how we respond when we don't get our way. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Right? If they continue to disobey when you told them not to do something, you created a border that they crossed. As soon as they cross that border, when they know what the border is, you don't discipline, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but you don't discipline kids without telling them what the borders are. That's why God gave us the Ten Commandments. They're borders. If you know what the borders are, then God is justified to judge you according to his law. Your kids, you are justified as a parent to discipline, lovingly correct your child when the borders you establish are crossed by that child. If you continue to let them cross those borders all the time, that is your fault. Nobody else can fix that for you. You have to be a man and a woman of your word. Because if you are faithful to following through with what you told your child to do or not to do, you're actually helping them come to Jesus. I didn't know what sin was, Paul said, except by the law. Without knowing what sin is, we don't see what we do against a holy God. The little things you do with your children now matter to their future salvation and their walk with God. So I am way ahead of myself, but I think it's really important. We don't think it's wrong to watch movies or play games and stuff, okay? But we have borders. And when we say yes or no, that is like the law of God to you as a son or a daughter. You do not have a right to dishonor us. If you do, when you're young, we will lovingly correct you. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. So model your relationship with God. Then modeling your relationship between your, you and your spouse. Go on a date night. Maybe you have to take your baby with you at first. Maybe there's nobody to watch. We don't have family here, so it's been hard over the years to leave our kids and go anywhere. But the reality is we took our kids almost everywhere we went. And as they got older, they became responsible. Now we go out, and if we have to, we leave them with their older sibling. That's why you should have a lot of kids. So you get to that place where the oldest sibling is what... (laughs) How you talk to each other in the house. What are you talking about? Husbands, don't get easily angered. Don't blow up and be a volcano in the house. And think again because you're the man of the house that you have a right to talk to people like that. Let me ask you this. Look up here. Is that how God talks to you? No, No, because if he did, you wouldn't even have a body or a soul anymore. So don't treat your spouse and your kids like that. Yeah, and I want to say this too for the women. Automatically, when your child is born, they are drawn to you as the mother. They're more drawn to you than they are to the father. But if you look at the sample that we have with Holy Spirit and the Father, what is the role that Holy Spirit does? Holy Spirit births us into the kingdom, right? And then the Holy Spirit draws us to the Father. So women, it is our job, not just to give birth, but to draw our children to their Father. We create for them opportunity for identity when we do that. So when you are saying to your children, your dad is this way or your dad is that way and you're dishonoring their father, you're also breaking their identity. Because according to scriptures, the whole family in Ephesians, the whole family is named by the father. That's that's a spiritual identity. Where do we get that? The spirit, Romans 8, the spirit calls in us Abba Father. So if we look at the parallels there, mothers, you parallel Holy Spirit. Because you give birth and your job is to draw your children to their father. So if I'm blasting him 
in front of my kids, I'm saying to them, your identity is broken. I'm breaking their confidence. And you wonder why I've done everything I'm supposed to do. I was a good parent. But were you a good wife? Did you draw them to their father? Or did you always blast or insult their father and push him away? You know, if you say I'm a good parent because I'm better than what my parents were, that's not good enough. Your standard is not who your parents were. It's God. God the Father. So that means that even when people don't treat you or say the right thing that you want to hear from your spouse sometimes, and it will happen, how you respond is just as important as if you were to say something negative. Do you understand what I mean? So our words carry heavy weight. So if I complain about Casey or she complains about me, we're teaching our kids that it's okay to complain when somebody wrongs you. Mm -hmm. But it's not okay. Jesus said, love your enemies. <laughs> Pray for those who hurt you, right? And we're not enemies. We may have an argument. We call it a prophetic conference. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, you got to learn how to not blow up in the car, you know, in public or in a room where the kids are sitting. If you got something you gotta talk about, you go in a room, you shut the door, and you don't raise your voice, and you talk through. And you, you pray together. you send a text message. When our kids were little, and you couldn't leave the room, you know, you had to like either write a message, or you know, like you send a message. I couldn't believe you did this. Send. What do you need now, honey? What do you mean? Oh. Anyway, you know, like you're, <laughs> you have this text message discussion. So when you work it out, <laughs> you go to the room, you lock the door, and then it's makeup time. <laughs> Married couples, makeup time is mm. wonderful. <laughs> you're That's like, what is he ends. talking about? You know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> That's part of married life. Look, you learning how to listen to each other and talk to each other is raising your kids more than you realize. Yeah. It's not just doing the right things perfectly all the time. How many of you have tried to do everything perfectly with your kids, you lovingly corrected them, you're totally at peace, and they still manifest the demons? <laughs> right? And they still go crazy. And you're like, what do I do next? <laughs> well, you know what? Sometimes you do everything you know to do. And for some reason, if it doesn't work out, you stop. You gather yourself. You grab your child. You pull them in close. And you say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, would you help us today? Mm -hmm. This is how we teach our kids to deal with conflict. Most kids don't know how to deal with conflict. So when, when they get older and they didn't know how to deal with conflict because they didn't see it modeled well when they were younger, they commit suicide. That is so heartbreaking to see a 13-year-old kid take their life because they didn't think anybody cared about them. And they're tired of hearing their parents arguing and things like that. Look, we got to do everything we possibly can. Being a parent is no joke. It's probably the hardest job in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. But it is also the most rewarding job. Yes, it is. And it takes a lot of effort. Why don't you talk about dethroning your child's selfishness to love others? Yeah, along those lines before I get to that, in 3 John verse 4, it says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Yeah. And I'm just telling you now, those of you who have children who are walking with the Lord, you know that it doesn't matter what else is going on in this world, that is your greatest joy. And if that's not working, it's also your greatest pain. Okay, go into the next one. Dethroning your child's selfishness to love others. This is one of the most challenging things because we are born selfish people. From the time that we're born, the first thing we do is scream for our way, right? 
which by the way, we do need, have needs. There's nothing wrong with that. But the reality is we, if you, in evangelism, we kind of have a little joke saying, but it's really true. If you want to start a good conversation in evangelism, you always talk about people's favorite subject. What is people's favorite subject? Themself. <laughs> That's everybody's favorite subject. So if you can start the conversation about themselves, you've got a good, good conversation starter. Why? Because we're selfish people. So from the time that our kids are very little, if you have multiple children, we call it the dethroning process. So little, you know, little Sierra, she's queen of the world. Everything is hers. The whole house belongs to her. Anything she wants, she can have. And then... The next child comes along. Guess what? Queen Sierra is not happy, right? And so she's going to struggle with the fact that now she's got to share a lot of things, not only our attention, but her, her toys and everything. Well, then, you know, the same thing happens. Each time the youngest gets dethroned, it's a hard process. And they always say, oh, that's just a hard transition. Poor little baby. It's a good transition. It's an amazing transition because it's good for them to recognize that they don't rule the world. It's healthy. And so if you only have one child, you have to purposefully dethrone their will by intentionally looking for ways for them to serve and love others and think of Amen. others. It's important. Cultivating uh, relationships, we have seen you know, through the siblings in our house is that they really learn a lot from each other. Is that when, when Sierra, listen, your first child is what we call the guinea pig. The experimental child. Okay? They're going to know all your failures. <laughs> They're going to see probably your biggest growth as a married couple. And then the second one comes, who Abby would say she was the perfect one. And Abby was like night and day to Sierra's personality. But yet, it wasn't too hard for them to come together. And then, you know, Jonathan, David, and Hannah added such a mix of personalities in our home that I remember one time we were not going to allow in our house our kids to be argumentative and fighting with each other. That was not allowed. See, in my house growing up, my brothers and I, we beat each other up all the time. Well, I beat them up all the time. <laughs> and that, that was the way it was. I mean, I had no respect for them. They were four years younger than me. They were going to do whatever I wanted them to do. And his younger brother has become a psychologist for this reason. <laughs> <laughs> And the other one is a bodybuilder, so I don't mess with him no more. <laughs> I was a horrible older brother. So we didn't want our kids <laughs> to carry on those curses anymore. <laughs> and in fact, you know, when, when they would, you know, start arguing with each other or taking something from each other, we always had to reinstate what was right and what was wrong in that moment for them. Because sometimes kids press the borders of what you establish to see if you're gonna follow through. And when you don't follow through, then they keep pressing the border. And after a while, they really don't listen to you until after you say something the second, third, fourth, fifth time. Your child should listen to you the first time you say something. That should be the goal. Why do you say that? Because if I'm standing at this road and one of my kids is going to run across the street and I say, Hannah, stop. You want her to listen the first time. Because the second time can be destructive. It's too late. So dealing with issues between siblings, we would try to deal with it right away. And sometimes it was like you're dealing with it several times a day. And it's like, is this going anywhere? But I'm telling you, reinstating 
who you are in their life, those boundaries is extremely important. In fact, you probably remember this story. David and Jonathan were having an issue one day. I think it was they were homeschooling or something. Uh, anyway, they weren't getting along. And Casey took one of my T-shirts and made, it, made them both get inside the shirt through the neck. And they had to wear the shirt together and walk around for a while and learn how to agree with each other. I thought it was brilliant. And then like 10 years later, it became like a, a Facebook sensation that like some young mother thought this idea up. I'm like, I've been doing that for years, whatever. But we are selling my t-shirts for a thousand pesos. So cultivate those relationships because look, we saw godly families not only had peace in their home, but peace between these siblings. We have seen siblings love each other, respect each other, and now our kids, despite being on two different continents, you know what? Three different countries. They love each other. They communicate all the time. They can't wait to be together. Yeah. And unfortunately, some of you know this, you might have a sibling, it's hard to get people together. They don't really care. And that is something that needs to be cultivated. And it's valuable. Not just for Christmas or Thanksgiving or birthday parties, but I want my kids to realize they have something special between themselves that they don't have with anybody else. Yeah. And that should be cultivated. Yeah, sometimes like when my kids would have <coughs> friends over, say, let's just give example, I don't even remember, but say for instance it was Jonathan had friends over the house and he's hanging with his friends and his friends say something to David or to Hannah and they have an attitude with her and then he joins, mm. I would say, I'd pull them aside and I'd say, Jonathan, these friends, they're great, but when you're <laughs> old and you've got your own children and you're married and all of that at Christmas time, guess what? They're not coming to Christmas. Do you know who's coming to Christmas? David and Hannah. So because they're gonna be with you for the rest of your life, you better watch how you take care of your relationship with them because that's a forever friendship. The friendships you have, the other friendships, they come and go, right? But especially if you move around like we do but they yeah. always had each other, which I'll plug this is another reason for homeschooling because they're not stuck with kids all their same age all day long. They learn how to interact with each other all day. So they keep that strong bond for the rest of their lives. Valuing relationships within the extended family and valuing community relationships outside the family. So extended family is, right, you know, uh, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, things like that, I mean, are valuable to your kids. And, okay, even if they don't live for the Lord, somehow build a bridge. Don't cut your family off. You want your family to come to the Lord, and you might be the greatest example that they see to come to Christ. The other side of it is, uh, if we could include my family more and Casey's family more, believe me, my kids, grandparents, would love to be able to be here. But it's very expensive to come to them from the Philippines. And, uh, you know, it's harder on them traveling since they're older. But our family relationships, when we are back in the States, we are constantly making sure that we're having time with these family members so they build memories with them. The other thing is relationships outside of your immediate family within the community. So like that would be the church family, you know. We probably spend more time with each other than we do with our own families sometimes. Uh, it's not that we're doing it on purpose, but for, you know, logistic re logistical reasons, you know, we might be farther away from our families. And so your church family becomes very important. When we first moved here with the four other missionary families, uh, the Saunders, the Baileys, the Cracknells, the Herbs, they became aunts and uncles to our kids. And we became that to their kids. And now those kids are growing up and they're getting married and they're having children. And they look at us as ates and kuyas in a very relational way, not just a cultural way. And we're friends on Facebook. I sometimes hear from these guys, 
you know, Casey does, or we communicate with them if we don't get to see them all the time. And every time we see each other for some gathering, we're, you know, embracing and loving them because, and, and that's how we want to be with, with your kids and how you, we want you to be with our kids because the influence that you have upon our kids and hopefully the influence we have on your kids or each other is huge. And it's so important that we don't just think, oh, just about my family and my kids. I mean, obviously, your main responsibility is your family. But the kids in this community should be all of our responsibility. It doesn't mean you have to pay for things all the time. It doesn't mean that you have to have all this time with people. But it does mean that these community relationships are more impactful to the development of your kids' personality, to how they know who God is, etc., than you realize. And I want to encourage you to see yourself as, as Ates and Kuyas here in the community because these kids who are raising up we want to be godly examples for them to say, oh, I remember Kuya Levi. You know, I remember Claire and Vidal, you know, and how they carried themselves. And there was something about your life that I saw when they were young, when I was younger. And it really made me uh, come to the decision about where I was going to go to school or the calling God out of my life. You don't really realize that, but it's actually very important. And part of the reason outside of our responsibility in teaching our kids how to hear from God of why we believe we have kids that love the Lord is because of the people around us that poured into their life. Like having the Sylvies here, we're all so refreshed by that, yeah. right? Because we know the type of people they are. Yeah. And, and we're like, wow, we want these type of influences in our kids' lives. Yeah, let's take some questions. Anybody has questions? We haven't. Hi, Tay. Kuya. Yung sa about boundaries daw, how do we know that we're setting up the right boundaries sa mga mali na boundaries, sa wrong boundaries? So this is what the Lord showed me because um, I noticed as a young parent that many times children would get corrected just when something irritated the parent. And I often would think, that doesn't really make sense. Only if it's irritating to me, then I correct it. It just sounds like I'm just being angry. But you know, the, the Bible gives us very clear instructions. And it, it's really easy to follow, to understand what are God's boundaries. And His boundaries, there's 10 of them to make it very simple, right? So if our kids are not disobeying one of the 10 commandments then the way I felt in my spirit was that was a teachable moment, not an opportunity for discipline. So for instance, if my child knocks over the drink at the table and it ruins everything, they did it by accident, maybe that bothers me because I just bought that tablecloth and I'm like, oh, it's so expensive and I'm so frustrated, but I still have no right to discipline because there wasn't an actual sin committed. That was an accident. So instead, I have to calmly hold my own anger, my own frustration, and use it as a teachable moment. I yeah. teach them how to not do that again. But if I have said to that child, I don't want you to pick up that glass because that glass is too full, and the child reaches out and then spills the glass, that's the moment that they've broken one of the Ten Commandments because honor your father and mother. I've already given instruction. They've not followed it. Yeah. So I have to be careful how many rules that I put out that I make it simple. God made it simple for us. We make it simple for them. But when they disobey a rule, it is a clear infraction and a clear response. Yeah. That's Does good. that help some? You know, one thing that, uh, and you may have heard me share this before, Casey, but when we were in uh, the States, once we were going through this town, um, where is it in Tennessee? Uh, Pigeon Forge. Pigeon Forge. And it's like, uh, you know, a fun place. There's, there's rides. There's 
fun events and things going on, hotels and all that. It's in the mountains, Smoky Mountains, beautiful. So we go through there a lot when we're traveling. And we would always stop there as a family to kind of create memories one or two nights. And so we went to this like store that sold all these little like, you know. Pasalubong kind of. Yeah, type of things. Little gifts from Pigeon Forge. And I don't know what Jonathan did. He, how old was he? He was still in a stroller, so he's very, he was very little. It's like four, five? Maybe younger, maybe And so he three was or walking maybe. by a shelf and took something and put it in his pocket and walked out and we got in the car and he says, look, mom and dad and, you know, Abby and Hannah are there and she goes, where'd you get that? Did you buy that? No, I didn't buy that. And we realized Jonathan took it. And we're like, oh, no, the missionary kid's going to jail. So we, we said, where did you get this, buddy? He says, oh, I took it from the place. And I realized that he did, we talked about stealing, but he didn't understand the concept. So was it wrong for him to do? Yes. But it would have been equally wrong for me to physically discipline him because he didn't know what he did was wrong. So... What we did is we explained to Jonathan, okay, Jonathan, well, this is a good teachable moment where when you're in a store like that, you can't take those things. You have to pay for it. You see the price on it? Uh, I said, we can't just take it. That's what the Bible means from stealing. When he realized he was, that's what he did, he got very upset and he felt contrition, brokenness. And so we went back and we said, okay, we want you to come inside. Let's go in together and let's give this back to the lady and you tell her that you're sorry you didn't, okay? And he did and he was a little upset. And then we took him and I, and I looked him in the eye and I said, Jonathan, I am so proud of you. And you know what happened? Is that he never stole anything as far as I know again. As far and listen, as we know. Here's, why is that important? Because we think if we discipline the kid physically when they don't know that it was wrong, that that's going to help them remember to not do it again. But it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. It's not condemnation, shame, or guilt. So it's important for us as fathers and mothers to know the situation that our kids are in and when you're going to know when they do something that they know is wrong. In fact, even ask them. Listen, in evangelism, when we're sharing the gospel, we don't, we don't, aim, what I aim for is not for people to just pray a prayer, but it's to come against their conscience. So I bring the law of God and I say, well, is it right to, to steal, to lie? Yes. Have you done it? Yes. What does that make you? A liar. When they are seeing that they have broken the command of God, whether they agree with it or not, their conscience is being open. Your kids, their conscience when they're small is wide open. You have the greatest opportunity to teach them now what is right and what's wrong so that when they get old, they will not depart. You see how these things work together? That was a great question. Yeah, good question. Yeah, thank really you. good. Anybody? Hi, now. Okay, Levi, come on. Hello, hello. Shoo! Uh, with your five kids, Sir Eric, how do you establish equality? How, how do you how establish you quality? Yeah, in terms of your treatment to them. Uh, you don't show favoritism. No. How do we show them quality of not being favored yeah. towards certain ones? Mm. Remember that equality does not mean sameness. So I can equally love all of my children and yet love them very differently. Yeah. And that's because they are created differently. Like Sierra is a words person. If you will tell her that she's doing a good job, Sierra can run off of that fuel yeah. for like 21 kilometers, <laughs> literally. If you know Sierra, you know what I mean. But 
for Abby, you could tell her something, but you, it doesn't matter unless you spend some time with her. Mm -hmm. You got to sit down with Abby and just listen and hang out. That's quality time. You have to know what each kid needs. Yeah. With Jonathan, I'm serious. You think this is funny, but I'm telling you, this is all I have to do. Jonathan's in a bad mood. I just go, hey, Jonathan. <laughs> and he's laughing. I'm like, how does that work? I have no idea. But I mean, seriously, to Boom. this day, that's all that it takes. So you just have to know what each... If I did that to Abby, she'd probably crumple in the ground and... Cr Ooh, <gasps> Mom! You know? Drama. So, yeah, again, every, <laughs> every kid is different, and that's why your love might be the, the same or equal, but demonstrated very differently. Yeah. Well, I think if we are focused on teaching all of our kids the same values because we're living it, it won't be hard for us to impart that quality. Does that make sense? So if I'm not living it, then I'm probably not going to be able to impart it. You know, there's one thing to talk from here. It's another thing to talk from here. And see, when we protect the Lord's word and his values among us and our relationship with him to each other and with our kids, to me, it naturally comes out that we're going to be quality because we're living, focusing on character all the time. And when we don't do everything right, which has happened only once or twice. Only for you. You know what we do? We, if I yelled at my kids what, and I said something out of anger, what are you doing, right? I would repent. I would get on one knee and I would say, uh, David, I want you to forgive me for the way I acted because it was wrong. And, and whatever else I need to say, would you forgive me? And most of the time it's, yes, dad, you know. <laughs> and then they embrace and hug you and there's forgiveness. But what you're teaching your kid is to produce fruit. How do you have a, quali a, a quality life with the Lord? You live a lifestyle of repentance. You don't separate and try and act perfect all the time, especially when you're wrong. And, I, I, and we have had to do that. If we had an argument and it was louder than what it should have been, we will go to our kids and say, would you forgive us? And, and, and sometimes it would be like days of on and off arguing. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Some of you don't want to admit it right now. <laughs> but it just seemed like things were tense. There was heaviness. There was financial burden. There were outside things that were causing you to, you know, respond and react the way that you should have, you know, different from the way you should have responded. And so that's what I'm saying, okay, is learn how to protect quality by honoring the Lord, honoring each other, even honoring your kids. Just because you have authority over them doesn't mean that you always have to express it this way. Sometimes expressing authority comes this way. 